that's literally what it was like as I'm walking down to go register for the brain surgery. But it was dark. Like, it was super dark. There was just family here, family there. Like, and these are all different people getting different surgeries. Life was nearly perfect in a way, right? And then boom, something like this happening. I just never, I never thought that that would happen to me, right? I knew cancer was real. I knew these things were actually real. Something that you're facing right now that's physiologically going on in your body needs to be healed within that line. And when you do this work, you heal it in your body and moving forward. I know that Logan has a state of worry. And because I've accepted that, it's now slowly, you know, letting go and it's making everything just way less stressful and, you know, all those things together. We got Logan Sneed on the podcast today. I'm so stoked. I've been working with Logan now for about a month. He's been my coach and it's been instrumental in launching Structured Flow, my integration program for seekers. So yeah, super pumped to hear Logan's story because I know that he wrote a best-selling book, Thank You Cancer. I know that he's been, I guess you would call it in remission, seven years of brain cancer and had several NDEs, but we're going to hear from Logan straight from him. So Logan, welcome to the pod. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Could yeah. you just give us a little bit of an overview for context of how this all started in terms of how old you were when you were diagnosed with brain cancer and just give us a little bit of the story. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it was March 6th of 2016 that like genuinely literally took my life from a complete, like a complete 180. But funny enough, well, it's not funny, but my tumor was in my brain for for six years. So basically this whole thing was like building up till one day I found out all about it. And I was, I was taking a picture in the mirror actually. And I was like, so excited. Cause I was like, cool, I'm going to start shredding up. Like I'm ready to kill it. It's going into summertime. This is awesome. So I was on, I was on a spring break in my college and my girlfriend and I went to school together. So we're back at home. Cause we went to high school together. So our families are like literally a neighborhood apart. And I was going to the gym. And after I took that photo, I get in the car and I, <clears throat> I was like, oh man, I'm in such a great mood. I'm just so excited. Life's, you know, going fantastic. This is just amazing. It's like, let me just FaceTime her. I've never FaceTime and drive my car at the same time. Never have I thought about doing that, but I did. So I just called her. I was like, hey, what's up, Kylie? Hope you're having a great, you know, whatever. Like just thinking about you, like just want to say hello and whatever, whatever. Right. Just being a good boyfriend, if you will. And like, as this, as this is happening, I started slurring my words. Like I was almost like drunk, you know, like when people are drunk, they just can't talk really. Or they're like, you know, they slur the words. So that's what was happening. And she started kind of laughing. And as that's happening, I then started seizing. So as I'm seizing, she's watching the whole seizure happen. And as she's watching this happen, I'm driving about 60 miles an hour on the, on the, the side highway, right? The side of a highway. And it was one of the busiest highways in Texas. So as this is happening, if I drove literally, I mean, just a couple of feet up to the left, I would have gone onto the busiest highway in the state and just, just gotten plowed over or just ran into so many different people. But I drove half a mile. I was unconscious. I drove into a ditch. There was literally no damage to the car at all. So as this is happening, they, she knew where I was going. And so she called the ambulance to come get me. And my car was locked, obviously, because, you know, when you, when you drive, it should be an automatic, you know, locked car. So they came in, they broke the windows, they got me out, they took me to the hospital. And then from there, they were like, okay, let's drug test him, let's alcohol test him, let's, you know, whatever we need to do to figure out what just happened. And there was nothing there because it's not what I was doing. So they were like, well, we don't know what's going on. You know, my parents were there, her parents were there, she was there. And they're like, the only thing that we can do is get an MRI. So they come back and they get an MRI and they were like, whoa, okay, you guys need to go talk to a, a neurologist, like something serious here. So I go see a neurologist and the neurologist is like, whoa, <laughs> you got to go talk to a neuro, a neurosurgeon. And I was like, oh, okay. And I just, and these things just never registered with me because like I was only, I don't know, it was like maybe 20, I mean, 24 hours that all this stuff was happening. So, and I, and I just, I never like, I, I've had a lot of physically traumatic things happen to me in my life. Like like a lot of bloody, you know, injuries and a lot of bloody moments, you know, I've been, you know, 
kind of left out. I've always kind of had a sense of worry that has just built up over time, but nothing like this, like to this level. No, I never thought this would ever happen. So it just wasn't that big of a deal. At least like at first it wasn't. So we go see the neurosurgeon. He was like, yo, good to meet you. Just want you to know this will be an eight hour surgery. You probably won't speak or hear again. And we're going to have to, you know, do this as soon as possible. And so that was a very like, whoa, like, you just said I won't speak here again. So why would I do this? Why not just like keep it there and live as long as I, I guess I can, you know? So we ended up, and by the way, he even said, he was like, oh, well, I know I said we got to do this as soon as possible, but just so you guys know, like I'm going on vacation for two weeks with my family. So I'll be back and then, and then we can get it done. I was like, all right, well, I'm literally going to be dead, dead. Like you just said, now you're just going to go on vacation. So it's not that big of a deal for you. <laughs> so we leave there and I'm very grateful for my parents are very like, you know, strong headed of like, you know, we want the best. We were going to get the best. Like we'll do what we have to do. So I was, you know, graciously connected to one of the best surgeons, brain surgeons in the world. He's known as like top three brain surgeons. His name is Dr. Raymond Sawaya. So we go to De uh, Houston to see him. And as soon as I go in there, I said, yo, Dr. Sawaya, I've heard you're the best. That's fantastic. But look, Am I going to speak or hear after this surgery? Because I want to figure this out. He was like, yeah, of course. Like, this won't be a problem. I mean, like, yeah, I can easily do this. I was like, okay, well, the other guy said that's not the case. So what, what's the difference here? He's like, I, I mean, it's me. Like, I can do this and it won't be a problem and you'll speak in here fine. And I was like, geez, I was like, these guys have the two most difficult or the most difficult job in the world. And you guys are giving completely different answers here. This is just, I've never seen this before. So. Anyways, he said, yeah, like, you'll be fine. You'll speak in here, but it's going to be about eight hours. I'll wake you up in the surgery. I'm going to ask you questions to make sure that you can still speak in here. And if you can't, then we're going to have to cut the surgery off short. And he said, it'll be about eight hours. You, you know, you'll get knocked out, obviously. So that day, crazy enough, I saw him at like 7 a.m., and he was like, we're going to have to have surgery. We're, like, you're going to have to be here at probably like 6.30 a.m., and we're going to have to do 12 hours of training to get you, you know, fully prepared and understanding like what, how your brain is functioning like right now, like literally today. And then I'll see you in the morning for the surgery. So I did all these crazy trainings, like, you know, touch your nose, like what's, you know, can you guess what this card is going to be like all these just weird training things. It was such a stressful day that I literally just passed out as I was going to get another MRI. I was getting MRI. I was going to this part of the campus over there. Like it was so, so stressful. So I just fainted. I passed out. And then I go to the surgery and as I'm going to the brain surgery, it was literally like going down, like, you know, in funerals, it's like, it can be a very darkening moment, right? You're walking down an aisle or you see this aisle, this aisle, they're crying, they're crying. I mean, that's literally what it was like as I'm walking down to go register for the brain surgery, but it was dark. Like it was super dark. There was just family here, family there. Like and these are all different people getting different surgeries. So I go there and they kind of then strap me up. They bring in the pastor and you say your, your last prayers, if you will. So signing waivers, all this stuff. And then family's coming in. So I'm going to the brain surgery room and I go in and I don't know if people can understand or remember what a football game is as far as like your offensive coordinators. They're up in the press box. You know, you've got like a bunch of them lined up, you know, watching the game, but they're all the coaches. That's literally what it was like going into that brain surgery. So there's like five doctors all lined up behind the glass wall looking and they all got their masks on. I can't see anybody. It's just the weirdest. Feel. It was the craziest moment I've ever experienced. And then boom, I get knocked out for the surgery. Then they wake me up in the middle of this to ask questions and stuff. I got everything right, which is good. <laughs> and I can still speak in here, obviously. So get out of the surgery they removed the whole tumor and it was the size of an egg so just imagine like a perfect egg that's exactly what was in my head and it was building up for six years and then boom it just like exploded one day which caused that seizure so what's crazy is that i thought like when this is done doctor was like oh dude this is like the surgery went perfect he was like we could not have had a more perfect surgery the whole thing was fully removed not 90 percent, not 95 100 percent. i was like perfect that's fantastic okay so I kind of like was like, cool, life goes on. I feel like it's a cool story to tell. I got brain surgery. Like, I feel like a badass, like awesome. Not a big deal. So then come back probably about a week or two later for the diagnosis, which I still didn't think that this was going to be that bad because everything's gone. They're like, oh yeah, 100% removed. So like it's gone, right? So I come back and she said, hey, Logan, this is a, a stage four glioblastoma brain tumor. 
She said the life expectancy on these are like a one and a half percent or less. She said the life expectancy for you is about a one to 10 year window. I don't know what we can really do about it. I mean, we will try the chemotherapy. We will put you on radiation. But like, other than that, that's all we've got. So we're going to do the best we can. And that was a like a, whoa, like, I didn't know. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to do. Right. So as that's happening, you know, my dad and my mom obviously are, they're shocked, but you know, I think they're prepared for the worst. I wasn't prepared for the worst because I just never thought that you know, I, know. I thought, you know, I grew up in a, you know, a great family, a, you know, great neighborhood, a great house, a great, you know, great everything. I was good at basketball. I was like, you know, cool. Like life was nearly perfect in a way. Right. And then boom, something like this happening. I just never, I never thought that that would happen to me. Right. I knew cancer was real. I knew these things were actually real. I just never, I don't know. It never came to me. Right. So in the middle of this, <clears throat> my dad was like, okay, so I understand the diagnosis, but is there like, I don't know, you guys have a diet recommendation, like should eat this, not eat that. Like, is there anything else that you guys think we could bring in? She was like, oh no, like, sorry, like this is all he can do. We've only got radiation. We only have chemotherapy. And he was like, okay, so, I mean, just want to ask again, like eating beers or drinking beers and eating burgers, like that won't do anything at all like that won't hurt him negatively that won't hurt that won't affect him positively like nothing and she's like yeah nothing at all like that's it nothing will work like he can go do that and that will not have any sort of effect and he was like all right this is making no sense so anyways i leave there and then as i'm leaving there i got like you know text after text after text how to go how to go how to go and then let alone my girlfriend right like that's gonna be the worst freaking answer i can give to my girlfriend so that's when life drastically changed. I became like massively depressed. I had literally no hope. I was like, all right, you know what? Forget it. Like, <laughs> I was like, I'll be dead. So what else, what else am I going to do? Right. So as all this stuff is kind of like growing, if you will, or as far as like, you know, I, you know, time is going by, right? I still don't know what I'm going to do. I had a friend call me. He was like, Hey, let's go paddleboarding here, you know, at the Ladybird Lake in Austin. So I was like, okay, sure. Whatever. I mean, what else am I going to do? So I go paddleboarding. He was like, hey, have you heard of the, the ketogenic diet? And I was like, no, never heard of it. And by the way, this is, I think, eight years ago. So like very, very, very long time ago when keto was not even a thing that people were talking about. He was like, dude, you should really like, you should look into this because they just did research that it can shrink tumors or prevent tumor regrowth. And they said it's, it was, the study was done specifically for glioblastoma tumors, which is what mine was. And I was like, okay. So what do I do? He was like, well, it's a high fat, medium protein, low carb diet. So basically you would eat, you know, eggs and meat and avocados and nuts and vegetables and oils. And that's about it. And I was like, okay, that's, yeah, that's pretty simple. So I literally had nothing to lose. Like whether people think it's like the best diet in the world or the worst diet, I was like, I don't care what it is. I got to try something. So I tried it and I literally stayed up till 3 a.m. that night, just like researching all about it. And then I started the next day and then I never, I literally never second guessed it. I never questioned anything. I just did it. And so as I'm doing it, people, like I was documenting my, my physical results because like I was, you know, getting super lean. I was getting super, super shredded. And I was showing this on Instagram and people were like, what are you doing? I was like, they were like, how, how is this like, how is this possible? You're doing chemo, you're doing radiation. How are you getting so lean and shredded? And some people thought it was fake. Cause they're like, there's just no way you can see those results while you're doing that. So I was showing it and I was getting literally message after message because I was going viral at the time and nobody was talking about keto. I was literally the first person to put it on, on Instagram. And uh, then I was like, okay, well, let me just start a business about this. And so I start this little, this little business and I was like, it's about $150. You know, I was like, I'm just going to make my program. I'm going to make what I eat in a day because I ended up getting really good at it. Right? It's like about a month went by and I was like, okay, I'm getting really good at this keto thing. So I made a little program. I was selling it. People were absolutely loving it. This one guy saw insane results that went super viral. And after that, like the business was taking off like crazy. And so I was getting so excited because I was feeling good. I was looking good. I had hope in my life. I was like, man, this is exactly what I wanted. I feel like I now have, I have my purpose. I, I'm so excited. And so I was telling my girlfriend, I was like, this is what's happening. I was like, I'm making a lot of money. Like, I, I, I honestly, like, I'm probably going to drop out soon because I can do this full time. And what you can do is like, you stay in college. 
I'm going to do this. Like you're going to graduate. We're going to travel the world. Money will never be a problem. I'll even stay on campus and like just work on my stuff. And like, and we had dated like all the way through high school and all the way through college. Right. So as this is happening, I then like woke up to this like crazy long text and she broke, she broke up with me over text. And I was like, I absolutely like, that was one of the most difficult moments, not because of like the, the, the woman her her, like the, the girl herself, because of the situation. Like it was like going like this, it was like going rock bottom, excited. Okay. Now you're going right back down and now you feel like you've got everything gone. Right. So I'll never forget. I was sitting in my room and she immediately goes to this like party. So as soon as I got this text, she goes to this football party and I'm like, what? I'm like, this is crazy. So I'm like bawling my eyes out. I'm like, what, what am I even going to do? I don't even want to be here. I hate college. So I text my mom and I was like, yeah, this is what just happened. And she called me and she was like, yeah, Logan, you're making enough money to live on your own. I'm going to pick you up tomorrow morning. Just pack everything up and we'll get you out of this place as soon as possible. And I was like, whoa, okay. So literally in 24 hours, I packed everything up, dropped out of college. I went, I lived with my family. And then probably after like, I think six months or so, I then went to go live on my own in, in Austin downtown. And like my life completely changed. It was, you know, obviously it was hard because I was, I was a 20 year old living on my own downtown. I didn't know a thing about what I was really even doing. I was just living life essentially trying to figure myself out. And then from then on out, business took off and I, you know, wrote my book, Thank You Cancer. And now I've, I've coached people like you and so many others on how to build their own coaching business because I know what it's like to start their business like in that space from A to Z while going through super hard, difficult times and while really trying to help people see results in that journey. So yeah, now I'm so grateful. I'm, I'm tumor-free, cancer-free, like nothing's there. It's been, I don't know, eight years, nothing's shown up. And doctors are like, like, this is just not normal. Like some people are like, I don't even know what's going on here. I'm like, yeah, guys, like I'm just being healthy. <laughs> it's all it is. I'm doing what I've, I've learned. I've, I've, developed a belief right? they have no they have no like they have they do never encourage me to keep doing my hard work they're just like yeah that's great like you know they, they, they literally think i'm lucky it's what it is so but yeah anyways like the whole the whole situation is like has given me given me my purpose it's given me my life i do public speaking i do coaching and i do stuff like this right i wouldn't be here telling this story if it didn't happen so a message to everybody else is like it always seems impossible until it is done because like they said that I, they were like, no, not like, oh, this could happen. They're like, no, 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 this is going to happen. So I had to do something about it. And that's what, you know, changed my life. So. That is quite the remarkable story, <laughs> Logan. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I was always curious because when I first heard about you through one of my coaches, Joe, you know, I knew a little bit about your story and knew about the book, but you know, you're very much, you market yourself with your coaching program leads cartel, you know, very much <laughs> business and prospecting sales, all this type of stuff. And it's just an incredible story. And I can see also, you know, it was eight years ago. So there's quite a bit distance from it. How old are you right now again? Yeah, 26. 26. So when you're 18 is when this all went down. It was it was like 19. I'm, I'm turning 27 in June. And yeah, 18, well, it's, been, it's about seven years, almost seven years exact, because it was around this time of years when like a month before things, you know, February, March, right? Like a month before things, you know, changed. So about seven years. Oh, got it. And in terms of like long term, not effects, but kind of, I don't want to say life expectancy, but you know, the doctors told you one to 10 years, right? And now what are they telling you? Just like, oh, you should be fine. We don't know because it's an anomaly. Like, what are they saying now? I, I wish they were saying that. Fortunately, they're, they're not. I mean, there are, I've talked to non pharmaceutical doctors. Like, there, there's neuro oncologists that are like very like textbook, like A to Z. They're like, they, there's no sort of like, like they believe in 100% science. They don't believe in any sort of like, you know, mindset, you know, health or anything like that. Like everything to them has to be this perfect two plus two equals four. So their whole thought process is like, like they, they just think that what I'm doing is like just a bunch of, bunch of BS or just not like, it's not going to do much. So I have to talk to non, like non real doctors, like more holistic, you know, freestyle doctors. And they're like, yeah, I mean, you're seven years in, nothing has come back. Like, I, we just don't see anything that is going to happen. Like some people was like, yeah, you're just completely gone. 
So people are like, yeah, I don't ever see it coming back. Like, so. So yeah. what is your outlook right now for the rest of your life? You know, do you have fears that it may come back or are those kind of at bay? And are you just moving forward with the mental fortitude, knowing that you can, you're sovereign and that you control your body and that you are doing all the healthy things. And if this comes back, you have that mental fortitude and strength to work through it. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, like, so through all the trauma that I've been through, again, it's all been, it's all been like very intense, like physical trauma. Like I've, I haven't been in like a legit fight, but it's almost like trauma that has created things like that, if that makes sense. And so I think naturally I've created this state of worry just from all the things I've been through. And I think that obviously that whole diagnosis and that situation definitely can add to that state of worry. So I'm actually working on my state of worry, right? Trying to get that out of my system, if that makes sense. And so I think like as building that, it gives me more and more confidence that it's not coming back every day. So I can't say that I'm like drastically, oh my God, like I just really hope it doesn't come back. I think subconsciously that can always be there and I think it always will. But I, I look at it every day, like every day that goes by lowers the chances of this thing coming back. And that's what the doctors have said. They said the longer the time, more time goes by and it's not back, the less likely it's coming back. So it gives me a positive outlook every time. So I, I genuinely believe it happened for a reason. Like, I don't think I'd be on here. I don't think I would be doing public speaking. I wouldn't be, you know, on social media. I, mean, I wouldn't be doing these things if it didn't happen. So I feel like a very long-term mission of mine is kind of changing the world of cancer. I think that's going to be like in a 10-year, 20-year journey. So I feel like I'm meant for that. So that's why I, 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 I don't believe these things will be coming back. So that is a beautiful journey and purpose changing the world of cancer. So right now, since you're addressing the worries that do come up, what are some of the ways that you're addressing those worries and concerns? Yeah, I'm actually about to I'm actually about to start like this 18 week journey with this chiropractor. I don't, honestly don't know much about this type of stuff, but just from what I've learned from what I've talked about how it can like massively have a have an impact on your genes. So the doc or not the doctor, well, she is a doctor. The chiropractic doctor is like, "Yeah, I think there's a gene that was passed down in your family that has created a massive state of worry." And I'm like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I mean, what she says is that we're going to go in and like fix a lot of different things to create better blood flow that can reduce a lot of stress, a lot of worry that could then hopefully negate that, that state of worry on even the little things, right? Like there's all like, I've always been like ready to solve and it's great, but because you're always ready to solve can also create a state of worry of like creating a problem almost in your mind that's not even existent because I'm always ready to solve. I'm always ready to solve and fight. So that's why, you know, I'm going in to hopefully get that fixed. And I, I'm confident it can. So, and I meditate every day. I literally, I'm, I'm doing about an hour a day to accept wow. the worry. I think that's like the biggest thing is a lot of people don't accept their, the links to their problems. Like mine, like being stressed out, like it's not that I'm stressed about like really hardly anything besides worry, right? So because I've accepted that worry and I'm like, okay, I know that Logan has a state of worry. And because I've accepted that, it's now slowly, you know, letting go and it's making everything just way less stressful and, you know, all those things together. Yeah. You know, that uh, it's so fascinating. There's, there's a lot that came up for me right there. I'm taking notes. I'm looking yeah. over notes, but one of the things that comes up for me is accepting the worry. I'm reading a book right now, 10 Secrets of Awakening. And there was one line that I found very powerful and it said the stoppage of karma is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, you know, we talk about acceptance, surrender, gratitude, and these type of stuff, or even forgiveness. And we think about it for others, but how often do we forgive ourselves? Or in this case, talking about accepting the worry and that just resonated. And I'm glad you brought that up. Another thing that came up for me was family constellations. So I had a call this morning. I see you nodding your head. Are you familiar with family constellations? No, but I think I know where it's going. Yeah. So I am not an expert. I heard about it for the first time two weeks ago, and I had like a 10 minute intro call with someone this morning that does it. But basically it's, it's very more, much more spiritual, you know, and I see that you're taking for the most part, a very grounded approach mixed in with some more Eastern philosophy type things as well, including mm -hmm. meditation in your mindset. But family constellations, as I understand it, goes back in your lineage and your really, you mentioned 
something similar. And they look at like, whether it's your paternal or maternal grand, great grandma, great, great, great grandma, grandpa, whatever it is. And something that is, is you're facing right now that's physiologically going on your body needs to be healed within that line. And when you do this work, you heal it in your body and moving forward. That's the way I understand it. It's, I don't understand it too much, but does that resonate? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's somewhat, because when I, when I went to this chiropractor, she, she wanted to know every, she wanted to know how I was born. She wanted to know what my mom would be eating in any drugs she was taking while I was pregnant, like anything. Like she wanted to know if, I, if my feet came out first or my head came out first. Right. I mean, that's how detailed she was. She was like, you know, what did your mom experience? What did your dad experience? Like all these different things. And she's like, yeah, okay, based on like, you know, what your mom had gone through, what your dad had gone through, you know, it seems that there's like a, a state of worry that is passed down, which, you know, can definitely help because my family works very, very hard. I work very, very hard. It's just kind of like part of the culture. And that's great because, you know, if you have a lot of worry, you're ready to, just, you know, just like try and, you know, fight everything. But again, it can always come back and be a double-edged sword in a way. So that's why like we're trying to, she's trying to go in apparently and change the state of worry, which will help with, I guess, I guess my spinal alignment, which links all the way up to my brain and it's like changing genes. I don't fully know, but I'm just going to trust the process and it sounds pretty, pretty cool. So hopefully it works. Yeah. You guys are definitely on to something because, you know, I think a lot of us are starting to really understand how much our body reacts based off of our mental state and that mental state of worry or limited, whatever the emotion is is something that comes from the societal conditioning and programming, right? And I think it's really massive work that you're doing to, as you put it, change the world of cancer. And for you specifically, that makes so much sense that if our nervous system is in a state of worry, that the body is going to respond in that way. So my final question for you would be, what recommendations would you have for people listening that are either facing something it themselves, whether it be cancer or anything else physiologically or someone that they're close to, what are some actionable steps that they could do? Yeah. I mean, it depends on the situation, obviously, but I think like anybody who is diagnosed with any sort of disease of any kind, you know, I highly recommend getting a second opinion because it saved my life. Like it was is literally a lifesaver and there's so many people who don't and i understand like i know people may have different money situations or different insurances like it makes a lot of sense but if it is at least slightly possible to get a second opinion like it is a huge huge thing secondly you know like i think really believing that there is a solution to whatever you're going through is a huge piece i've seen people who have said like now i understand there's, there's different me mental health conditions that could be, you know, physical conditions that's causing that mental health issue, right? I, I totally get that. But deep down, like, I truly believe there is a solution to 99.9% .9 of problems out there. And because of that, like, whatever you are experiencing or going through, like, tell yourself deep down that you will work to find a solution, or you will find somebody who believes there is a solution. And for me, like, Again, whether I live to be 110 or I get hit, hit by a bus tomorrow, I don't know. But because somebody did tell me, hey, this is something you could do, actually, it gave me so much drive. It gave me so much purpose in my life. It just made life fun. And it always has been. So I really believe there is a solution. People just have to believe that. And they have to be willing to obviously put in the work for it. But I don't see it as work. I see it as enjoyment of the process. So yeah, just again, it depends on so many different situations, but that's kind of, you know, what I would say for that. No, it's so true. Belief is absolutely powerful. And, you know, I can't speak from experience myself. Luckily, I, I'm not trying to call that in, but absolutely. Like I can only imagine when I see it in people I know and kind of their mental fortune, their mental strength, like to your point, it's so easy to get caught up in like a victim mentality of poor me. And like I said, I, I have not experienced this, so I'm not trying to come off mental at all because I could only imagine. Right. But to your point, if you can find that belief, right. And it sounds like you brought in a little bit of curiosity and play as well 
to kind of like, oh, this is interesting and different. I'm going to approach it versus, you know, this is this massive thing I'm trying to work through because that actually creates more worry. And what did we just diagnose? Oh, even though we're not doctors yeah. or anything like that, it is the worry, right? Totally. So this is a shorter podcast. Thank you, Logan, for yeah, who you are, how you show up, how you support me. For anyone interested in going deeper with Logan and connecting with him, I have links in the show notes to his website, his Instagram, his book, Thank You Cancer. And if you are a coach or you're someone with a message and a platform that's looking to grow and looking for ways to scale your business and grow your coaching business to impact others, definitely check out Logan's program, Leads Cartel. I'm a member. It's helped me tremendously. And I can't speak highly enough about Logan, his integrity and character. Thank you so much, Logan. Well, thank you, man. My quote is, it always seems impossible until it's done. Boom. <laughs> Love it.